Well, it is certainly an honor to be here tonight um, to talk about Special Olympics and to actually to get your help in solving one of our biggest challenges uh, that we're dealing with right now. Our staff at Special Olympics Colorado is smaller than the number of people in this room. And we are a statewide organization that serves almost 21,000 people with intellectual disabilities across the state. Um, from age two and a half all the way through no upper age limit, we have athletes in their 60s and 70s still competing. So Special Olympics is something that people come into at whatever age and tend to stay for a lifetime. They tend to do about an average of three sports a year. And so it's, it's more than just sports for them. It's a lifestyle, it's a friendship, it's a place where they can build their self-esteem, uh, make friends, have a social life, and be part of their communities. Um, just to give you a little history um, about Special Olympics, we are in 2018, we'll be celebrating our 50th year in existence as a nonprofit. We were actually started by Eunice Kennedy Shriver, uh, who had a sister with intellectual disabilities. Do you guys all know what intellectual disabilities are? Do you know the population of people we serve, or shall I talk about that a little bit? There are actually three organizations that can use the word Olympics. There's the five rings that you see on TV, right? There's the Paralympics, which serves people with physical disabilities. And the third organization that can legally use the word Olympics is the Special Olympics for people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities. So we're talking about people with autism, people with um, uh, lower IQ, generally below 70 would be considered. So any kind of disability that has to do with thinking, uh, brain kind of functioning. Many of our athletes also have a physical disability but the only thing that um, qualifies you to be in Special Olympics is having an intellectual disability. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so we started almost 50 years ago. Uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver had a sister and she was uh, a huge advocate for people with intellectual disabilities, I think based on the life of her sister and really believed that um, people, all people deserved an opportunity to train and compete in sports. Um, we are the world's largest sports organization, um, serving almost 5 million people worldwide in 180 countries. As I mentioned in Colorado, we serve um, almost 21,000 people with intellectual disabilities. People with intellectual disabilities comprise about 3% of the population. So if you look at the population of Colorado, there's on average about 150,000 people that would qualify to participate in our programs. Um, one of the things that makes us different than a lot of sports organizations, um, both for people and with disabilities and, and for typically developing people, is that our athletes are actually divisioned by age, by gender, and by ability, so that when they compete, they're having a truly competitive experience um, sometimes people think that Special Olympics is just for fun. Isn't it fun and games? And those people kind of do this thing over there. But it's truly a bona fide sports organization where our athletes are uh, working hard to better their scores, to um, participate at their level of competition. If you came to one of our competition, it would be rare for you to see athletes where one just runs away with the field, for example, in a track event, because they are divisioned to be um, truly competitive. We also, um, we have 22 sports over four seasons. Uh, as I said, our athletes typically compete in about three sports a year. So it's an ongoing participation for them. Um, we're divided into a fall, winter, spring, and summer, uh, which starts with area or regional competitions, moves to state competitions, our athletes also then have the opportunity to compete at a national level in 2018. They'll be competing in Seattle uh, for Colorado. And this March, we have a group of athletes that are going to Austria to compete in the World Winter Games. So it's a progressive um, organization where athletes can continue to compete at the highest level. Um, when I came here 10 years ago, we had about 8,000 people participating in Special Olympics. Um, when I do talks like this, typically I'll have an athlete with me and the athlete will speak and I'll kind of stand in the background because they are tremendous advocates for themselves and for what they do. 
But as I listened to our athletes speak when I first came here, I kept hearing the same thing over and over and over, which was um, that school was not a great experience for them. Most of them, they're four times more likely to be bullied than typically developing kids. They uh, typically are isolated. Many of them are in that special ed classroom down at the end of the hall, if you think about your middle school or high school experience, and they're just not part of their school community. Um, we felt like we couldn't be on the sidelines to that anymore, and as a result, in 2008, we developed our program um, for kids in schools, which is, was called Project Unify. And Project Unify in and of itself was designed to create inclusive and welcoming um, schools for all students. What's important about that is that everything that we do now at Special Olympics is inclusive, meaning that um, our, we play unified sports, so you're just as likely to play on a team with our athletes as anybody else. Um, they're a mixture of typically developing people and people with intellectual disabilities. So our school programs were divided into three uh, different areas. The first being unified sports. Importance there is that kids played on the same team. They play on the same team just like a high school basketball team. They wear the same uniforms. They have the opportunity to letter. They have the opportunity to attend the athletic banquet. They're doing everything that a student athlete does in that school. The second component of it is youth leadership because we have found that if you, anything you, time you come into a school from the top down, um, there's a lot of resistance because of budget and time. But when you bring it up through the students um, as their their interest, what they want to have happen, that it happens more frequently. So we really work with our kids, once again, inclusively, um, to uh, show leadership throughout their school. And third is um, whole school engagement. I don't know if any of you have ever seen an R Word campaign where kids, students, we have um, many colleges, take the pledge to stop using the word retard or retarded. Uh, to stop that hurtful language, to turn it into respect. And basically, while our mission is around uh, providing Olympic-type sports for people with intellectual disabilities, the new Special Olympics, as I call it, has really ev evolved into an organization that's a social justice organization that's really around uh, creating um, inclusivity, um, welcoming environments, helping people with disabilities find their true voice and be able to take their place in, com in our community where they belong, and uh, what we've learned from our schools is that bullying is going down, kids are realizing they're more alike than different, and um, the whole inclusivity of the school is increasing. Um, we also started a program for young athletes um, in 2008. Before you had to be eight to participate in Special Olympics, now you can start at two. So from two to seven, um, what you're what we're looking at is that's the greatest time for brain development, brain growth, right, is those younger years. And so we've got kids working on gross motor skill development and social skill development through play, balancing, running, throwing, you name it, um, inclus in inclusive preschool settings uh, as young as two and all the way through seven until eight when they can begin to train and compete. And finally, our strategic plan this year moving into 2020, from now until 2020, is really focused on athlete health. Because what we've learned from some of our data is that our athletes aren't necessarily getting healthier by participating in Special Olympics. Uh, when we started 50 years ago, it was really sports skill development, right? You look, come in and you learn how to play soccer. We're not doing a lot of conditioning. We're not doing a lot of education around nutrition or hydration or how to live a healthy lifestyle or that kind of thing. So our focus is really going forward um, for the next three years, three to four years is gonna be on engaging our athletes in a healthier uh, way of living. So that's kind of an overview um, of who we are. Um, one of the things that we found um, and why this challenge or this project is so important to us is because, as Andy said, we don't have the resources to answer some of our most burning questions. When you go from a situation of 8,000 athletes to over 21,000 athletes, um, you can imagine that that growth has been pretty fast, pretty furious, and let me back up for a minute. 
just so that you know, we are, like I said, we have a really small staff, but our program is run by 9,100 volunteers across the state. So we couldn't do what we do, we couldn't offer the level of services that we do um, without volunteers. And all of our coaches are volunteers. None of them are paid to, to coach our athletes year round. And you might imagine it takes a lot of people trained to be able to do that. Some of the challenges that we face with our, with our athletes uh, that you'll need to look at in this challenge are they have limited access to resources and transportation. So as you grow from 8,000 to 21,000 and growing athletes, we have to figure out where we need coaches, what sports we need coaches for, um, what age groups we need coaches for, and how do we begin to recruit and train those coaches so that our athletes have the opportunity uh, to play. Does that make sense? Because right now, our coaches come to us on a volunteer basis, and wherever they are, we train them and we build a team around them. But there's no systematic or logical way that we go about evaluating coaches. We don't even know where we need coaches, for example. We're in 240 schools. We'll be in 265 by the end of this uh, school year. And all of those athletes, while they participate in school, they need to be able to participate in community programs too. Because one of the most important things is our, as our athletes age and when they get out of school, often there's, it becomes a huge void. They're out of their school sports. Um, their friends go off to college, DU and other places. Um, and they're kind of left behind again. So one of the things that's really critically important is we find the coaches so that these guys can continue to participate, continue to have an active uh, life, um, but also we need to have them in the right sports, in the right place, um, because transportation, money, all of those things are issues for our athletes. Make sense? The other piece that, that uh, we've talked about and are, are gathering data on is we're in these 240 schools. And we've been able to do that um, once again with a big burst of growth, but now we really need to start looking um, at where does that growth need to continue to occur? Where, what school districts, what schools statewide, where shall our growth pattern be? Questions? Well, we started, it's a good question. We started in the Denver metro area because our greatest resources are here. So we're in all the major school districts here. And when we say schools, we mean from preschool all the way through college. So um, we have a program at, uh, that we're building at CU, at CSU, at UNC, and then we have them all the way through preschool here. We have not done much outside of the Denver metro area because of resources, basically. Our, we've done some growth in the Northeast area, so you'll see us in schools like Poudre Valley, things like that, but we're not in Colorado Springs. We're not out uh, on the Western Slope. We're just this little microcosm right here. So what we have to do is develop the teams to go in and start the programs, but we really need to know what makes the most sense. I think most athletes, as well as the resources. The other thing about Special Olympics is that we don't receive any government funding, so we raise every dollar in the community. So when you look at that, you also have to look at who can sponsor this, who can pay for this. We raise $5 million a year, every single year, from the Colorado community. So that's individuals, corporations, foundations, the whole thing. So every kind of expansion we do, we have to be able to find the resources to support that expansion as well. We do. Um, we do about a half a million dollars in foundation grants a year. Um, West Era, who is uh, sponsoring this contest, has a vested interest not only in DU but in Special Olympics. They're a huge sponsor of our school-based programs. So we find uh, both for-profit and um, businesses 
to support what we do. That's a good question. We actually um, train coaches and or teachers within those schools. So we really use a train the trainer kind of model. We go in, um, we teach them to set up the program. We train them to be coaches if they don't know how to be, if they haven't been coaches in the past. Um, we also have liaisons who work with our kids around the leadership and the whole school engagement. So we'll have two or three different people within each school that we train. And it's more than that because it's by sports. In our schools, in the fall, we do flag football. Our winter sport is basketball. Our spring sport is soccer. We do cheer year round. And then we have a few schools that do their own thing like track and um, tennis. But like with basketball, for example, they're setting up leagues. They're playing the same schedule that their varsity and JV plays. So they're playing in leagues and then they come to our state competitions that we host. We also have worked, just so you know, um, with um, DU. Uh, when we first started our program, they set up our evaluation component through the Women's College um, to, so that we could show that what we're doing was working. And we've been studied since the onset by the University of Massachusetts at Boston to show that our programs work, that they make a difference, and that we're really changing the face of uh, inclusion uh, throughout the state. Well, not necessarily in schools, um, in communities, in our community programs, because we need to be strategic. We have not been strategic about where we find our coaches. People just tend to call us and say, hey, I'd like to be a coach and I live in Monument. Okay, great. We provide the training, they become a certified coach. We connect them either with an existing team or they start another team or what have you but there's no strategy or no thoughtfulness behind what we're doing in terms of we're gonna have 200 young people graduate from the Cherry Creek School District next year and they have no coaches or a few coaches um, and where do we need to find people and in what sports so that those guys don't come out of school and not have any place to go, right? One of the things that I don't like about what we're doing, and, and hence this project, is that our athletes are getting tremendous attention in their schools. They're making great friendships. They're doing all of that. And like I mentioned before, they um, graduate. And most of the, a lot of the typically developing young people are off to college or the military or jobs or what have you, and they're still left behind in their communities. And so we're trying to get them engaged earlier in our community-based program. But to do that, we've got to have coaches. And we've got to. Is there a table given in terms of what you currently have existing in the schools? And then given those things, like where do you best place the coaches in the communities to try and have good connections with people graduating high school or any sort of community support? Exactly. And looking at the, the ages of our current athletes whether they're playing in schools or not because one of the important things we found is to get them engaged even before they graduate so that they can um, already be fully engaged uh, because there's a huge drop in participation in the 18 to 25 year old category and then they some a lot of them find their way back in but th that drop isn't necessary A lot of our athletes tend to stay in the same general vicinity, um, either where there's 21 community center boards which provide resources for people with intellectual disabilities by catchment area. So they're typically gonna stay 
in that catchment area, whether they're living independently, living in a group home, living at home with parents or family or caretakers or what have you. They tend to stay pretty close to that same place. Yeah. Are these partnered with rec leagues around different communities um, in, trying, in, in those types of already well-established coaching streams? That's a great question and yes. Um, we do do that. One of the problems that we have in offering only that is that you have to pay to participate at the rec centers. And that's prohibitive for a lot of our athletes. So we want the rec center partnerships because they do great work. But we have to have kind of a parallel system for people that don't have the resources or want to play differently. How important is scheduling, having a consistent schedule to those time frames? Like basketball, like rec basketball teams around town, like feeder teams at Cherry Creek High School mm -hmm. have to move within the school district based on gym availability. Right. Is that a struggle that your organization takes well with resources? Absolutely. Uh, like when you look at DPS, those schools, for example, tend to be so much older, they tend to have one gym. Um, and boys teams, girls teams, JV, you know, varsity, all of that. So yes, uh, it is all, space is always a challenge. Facilities plus, on top of it, we have to get it donated for the most part. We pay for some. But um, mostly, uh, we do about $1.7 million is in um, in kind. Uh, and most of it is facility. Any other questions? Our teams are, um, individual sports are divisioned by gender. Um, our team sports uh, are uh, mixed gender. We don't have, we have some all male teams and all female teams, but predominantly mixed. So our coaches can coach. They can be a female coach coaching a male team. Is it, was that your question? Males and females practice together. Sorry, I forgot to repeat all the questions. I apologize. Um, yes, uh, we're all gender neutral, so you can play on any team that you want. We have a, a men's softball team that one woman plays on. You know, it, it really just depends on who their friends are, where they live, and what their skill level is, because they're also divisioned into uh, skill ability, even on, in team sports. We can teach you if you've never even seen a ball before. You don't have to have um, any specific skill set. Uh, and we do that through uh, online stuff. We're partnered with both CHASA, the uh, High School Activities and Athletic Association, as well as the National Federation of High Schools, um, provides online training. Um, we also do uh, clinics, coaches clinics in person. We do a coaches summit. Um, we train them on everything that they do and we have different levels of certification. So they can come in as an assistant coach, for example, if they're not ready to coach their own team, they can work with um, somebody that's been doing it a while and then they'll, we'll branch off and start another team. The other piece to this though is because we haven't done this, we have to fit, we'll also have to match the athletes to those coaches. So you can tell us we need coaches all over the, you know, these places, but we also need to know, okay, our athletes are here. So. Yes. I would say so. We, you guys will probably look at our data and go, oh my, but uh, we think we're great. No. Um, <laughs> We're, we uh, do have a system because they register and have to have a sports physical 
that we know generally where they are. <laughs> well, we have access to the evaluation data. Oh, you could. Sure. The evaluation data is all on our um, school-based programs, and it's really um, the data is mostly around, you know, is bullying reduced? Um, have you, you know, have you, it's, it's more on the social justice yeah. side than the sports side. Number of, number of bullying incidents a year, or, or what kind of what are you looking at? A lot of that is, um, it, it is taking the school statistics and their own baseline per school, because we work with a liaison at every school, and most of it is done through surveys. Some of it's done through site visits. Uh, several times a year, we also did a random clinical trial with schools here that had never participated versus schools that had. Um, so it's it's done differently and I am no expert but yes we have all of that for eight years yeah right where they are um, we Mm -hmm. Our school-based program coaches are done two different ways. They're either done at their school uh, and we come to them or they're done in um, at schools but with entire groups uh, of teachers and coaches. Um, our community-based coaches, they come to whether it's at a hotel or a school gym or wherever we set them up all over the state, then they come to those trainings. We also do them online and we do uh, a lot of video training as well. Yes. What's your turnover like for coaches and athletes? Like how long do people tend to be involved? Our athletes tend to be involved on average as I go down for 13 years, um, many of them longer. Um, and our coaches <laughs> tend to stay. I can't tell you exactly how long, but I can tell you that we've had coaches that have been here since we started in Colorado 47 years ago. I mean, into their 80s, they're still coaching. So it's, Special Olympics is an interesting organization having come from child welfare where there's a tremendous amount of turnover at Special Olympics. Our volunteers tend to come and stay. It's very rare. Um, and that's all due to our athletes. They get engaged with our athletes and, and they don't leave. We have a great uh, core group of volunteers. I mean, when you think we put on 100 competitions a year throughout the state, that is all done by volunteers. You know, so it's a, it's a pretty strong group that sticks around. Do you provide time estimates for coaches? If you're going to coach this season, the expectation is you will be Four hours a week. Mm -hmm. We do. A week. And what we've done and why we're really interested in, in recruiting coaches is that we have a huge cadre of coaches that still do that sports specific training. And so as we move into this next group of coaches, we have some that, that want to come along with that, but some kind of, you know how you always have your old school uh, coaches that continue to do it the way that they've always done it. We're going to be training this new group differently that they have a minimum of two practices a week. Um, they train for eight to 10 weeks. They attend a minimum of two competitions. You know, all of that is really laid out for them. And they have a training, they have a conditioning and fitness component as well as sports skills. When you have the job participation on the 18, 20, age group, do you track at all? Like, is it just wide between after, after graduation or is it solely because there aren't coaches? Um, we don't have a ton of it, and that is because most of our athletes are not necessarily, they don't have smartphones, or not nece necessarily um, technically savvy, if you will. It's, it's very hard to track a population of people that you, you may not be able to reach out to. 
And it's the ones that we lose, those are the ones that we're concerned about because we don't know. We don't know where they're going. We don't know what's happening. The other thing, just so you know, and, and hopefully can get excited about this, am I going way over my time? Okay, is that our athletes, you know, about 10 to 15 percent of people with intellectual disabilities are employed um, nationally. Our athletes are employed in Colorado at about 63 percent. And we really believe it's as a result of the, uh, the friendships that they make with our volunteers, with our coaches, with our partners who are typically developing uh, people, um, and people begin to recognize their strengths and their talents and um, our athletes are getting jobs and they're working and they're staying there and so we we believe the work that we're doing is like I said is a social justice model way beyond sports although sports sports are the core of what we do it's fun our athletes have fun and it's important but we've really moved from that nice organization over there to a socially relevant important um, group and that's why we need your help with this so we can Go to the next level with our athletes. Mindy, thank you so much for coming out. Absolutely, my pleasure. <laughs>